Hello everybody, greetings from Melbourne where it's incredibly hot but I thought I'd take this opportunity just to say hello and start off with episode 3 because I do have a lot of things to show you. I've had to switch the um, fan off so it's going to get hot in here in a little while but we'll keep going um, as um, my mum said it's hot so what we'll just grin and bear it and I will share what I've been making so this is episode three after a long hiatus um, welcome to 2021 happy new year I think I'm still within limits of wishing everybody a happy new year I hope this year will bring you much happiness and I hope you have an opportunity to follow your passion after all passion is what makes life worth living isn't it so let's get on with it I have a lot of things to show you and I have a brand new obsession as well that I would like to share with you so I'll show you um, my the the project that's been finished the longest and is probably quite passe at this point but I'm going to tell you about it anyway I wonder what I've done with the book I oh there it is in September in Shetland they have the Shetland Wool Week and everybody who's ordered the book internationally I'm sure you now have your book so there's no chance of you um, being subjected to a spoiler alert I don't think because this was in September and and they bring out um, a an annual and when they have the Shetland Wool Week they also have a patron they choose a patron to represent Fair Isle Knitting and this year it was uh, Wilma Malcolmson and she and what the what the patron does as well is they design a hat and then when you go to the Shetland Wool Week which I haven't been to yet everybody could sort of dons their their hat and it's generally a free pattern and um, I try to make most of them when they come out some of them I don't like and, and then I just give it a miss but this one um, I was I really liked this book the whole book is uh, full of really gorgeous patterns lovely articles and those of you who've got the book I'm sure you've read it from cover to cover already but here it is and this year's um, uh, hat was called Katie's Kep and I did uh, knit it up and and I think it's come out really beautiful I love it when Fair Isle is kind of traditional traditional Fair Isle I like traditional Fair Isle and I'm particularly enamored with that star on the top of the hat I would put this hat on but I'm running the risk of spontaneously combusting so I won't just having my hands in it like this is really hot I think it's about 36 degrees outside but the the yarn but I cheated the if you look at uh, generally most fair isles use uh, like a background color and then they have three or four contrasting colors and so you do still only use two colors per row but what I did was I cheated with this one and I'll show you in a minute the yarn I used I really like the yarn I used I thought I, I was watching a few YouTube channels and uh, apparently I have to say this um, I'm not being sponsored by anybody if I show you anything it's something that I've bought and that I'm crazy about or I've tried and I've and I've liked so before I show you the yarn along with the um, <laughs> with buying the book you can also buy the little pin pins are a thing I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to make use of all the pins that I have um, but they're pretty anyway so we'll see I'm sure I'll find I'd like to have them all together but I, I don't know how that's going to work anyway back to the yarn I used an Italian yarn called Sessia Dahu it's 50% wool 25% alpaca 
and 25% acrylic. So I used the mustard color for the main color, but then I cheated. They make a Dahu Fancy, which is a variegated yarn. And I really thought these two yarns sit so beautifully together. I couldn't resist. And every time I pack this yarn at work, I feel, oh, it feels so good. I really wanted to make something with it. So I took it um, to make the cap. And I'll tell you, so if you haven't tried it for Fair Isle, I highly recommend you try it for Fair Isle because it's nice and sticky. So the, the patterns really come out ungappy <laughs> because the yarn sticks um, the stitches stick to each other the other thing that's nice about it is that it's I'm not the world's biggest alpaca fan but I think 25% alpaca in a wool makes it just beautiful soft to the touch it's got a little 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 bit of a halo if you look over there it's got an absolutely beautiful color range so if you're thinking of doing Fair Isle, like normally you can you can use the Jameson um, Jameson yarns that, that are especially for Fair Isle, but I find them even after washing a, for me personally just a little bit still a little bit itchy. <laughs> and I know I'm a little bit of a princess when it comes to wool. I, um, so just the addition of the 25% alpaca made a very, very big difference. So any of you watching, if you can find this yarn, we have it at our store, um, but I'm sure it's readily available in, in most places. I would highly recommend you try and use this as an alternative to the, some other four plies that are out there for Fair Isle. The other thing that's amazing about this yarn is, if I remember correctly, this is a four ply, right? And it's a 50 gram ball and it's got two is that right 230 meters on a ball so that's going on forever so it's good value for money and i think it looks really good in the fair I'll, I'll i'll see if i can come up a little bit closer so you can see how well it works and i like the idea <laughs> i think that cheats the cheats way of doing the fair isle worked quite well um, in that cap. I'm very happy with the outcome and I'm looking forward to wearing it in winter as I think it will be lovely and warm. So that was a finished object from so long ago, but, but I have been sock crazy and I've been trying to figure out the best way to use sock yarn how much of it to use in a pair of socks and I've been I have to admit being a, a little bit sidetracked and involved with socks and then this other obsession that I have lately <laughs> but I did I've been knitting a few pairs of socks um, the first pair that I knitted were, were, were these and these actually made it through Socktober I think I finished them on <laughs> on the 31st of October so I managed one pair of socks through through October um, I knit very vanilla socks I really do so I normally knit cuff down I do a very classic turned heel with the heel stitch and um, just um, normal toe I do like to use the odd little stitch and I love this one uh, I normally don't take the stitch down into the foot. I uh, normally just carry up on the top. Um, this yarn was um, Schöppel, uh, which is a German yarn, a German sock yarn, and it was the Tweed. Uh, and I think it's the Schöppel sock yarn is called Admiral, and this one was the Admiral Tweed. And the, the green was also um, just also Admiral Tweed. tweed. In, in the green. I like the color combination. I like the way it's turned out. And then I've, as I might have mentioned before, I'm not the world's biggest fan of symmetry. So I've started to do this. This is my new thing. <laughs> I'm going to be putting just on one toe, I'm going to be putting just one contrast line. 
just for me to satisfy my my need for asymmetry i tried to then so i put the red in in the toe here and then i thought oh well then i'll put the red up in the cuff here but really you can hardly see it so i'm not going to be doing that but i'm definitely going to this is going to be my thing <laughs> if so if i if you have 20 pairs of socks in your drawer and i've and i've given you one pair the one that you will recognize is mine is the one with one little contrast uh, row of knitting by the toe but that was the that was the the, the sock that I managed to get into Socktober by the skin of my teeth. Um, you can see this little, very sweet little pattern. The reason why I've been so um, um, involved with sock knitting is because I want to put together a little um, encyclopedia of stitch patterns that are very good for, for sock knitting sort of for stitches that have two stitch repeats, three stitch repeats, four stitch repeats, and then how many stitches, sort of, I've started at 56 stitches, and I've gone up to 72 stitches, and then across there'll be which ones are, like, um, I think 56, you've got, it's divisible by two, and by four, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to get that together. I want to have maybe four or five little patterns that are divisible by four and then four or five by two, four or five by three and then just put them all together in a little encyclopedia and upload them to my Ravelry account for free but maybe in my next episode I will have achieved that. So that was that pair. Then I knitted another pair of socks. I've had this yarn in my stash for ages, this yellow yarn. It's a yarn um, that was dyed by my friend Jen, who has a shop called Little Yellow Cat. And I, I actually contacted her and asked her what the base was because it's so good. I love this base. If you're looking for a nice, robust, I can't, I really can't tell you how much I just love knitting with the sock yarn. I'm definitely going to be getting more from her. So again, once again, vanilla sock pattern. I never vary. But I do put things like maybe a, just a little cable. So you have a left and a right sock. And um, yeah, nothing much more to say. The green was again shuffle uh, in the Admiral Solid. I'm sorry, I'm actually perspiring. In the Admiral Solid. Um, just in a piece that I had and I've put my new little signature into into the toe So that's the second pair of socks and these are both for me and then I Offered to help my auntie Keep my cousin in socks So I'm knitting him a pair of socks with 72 stitches and I've also this yarn here I bought this in South Africa and now I've forgotten to make nurturing fibers. Such a beautiful yarn. In the, the cuff, the heel and the toes. And then uh, my lovely friend Robin, who lives in Grayton, uh, gifted me this um, sock yarn, which is West Yorkshire Spinners, uh, which is a British yarn. And it came along with the pattern and, and I tried doing the pattern and it just wasn't working for me. I, yeah, you know, you know, sometimes things just don't work for you. And then I, when I offered to, um, to knit some socks for my cousin who lives in London, I thought, that's it. This is, this is so like Tweedy and British. I'm, I have a little pattern going through it. Again, also going through the top of the, the foot and then just keeping it plain underneath. Uh, at just a regular turned heel, as I said before, 72 stitches. But what I wanted to show you, why I've got it on, on the sock blocker, is if you look very carefully over here, I don't have holes here. And I know that a lot of knitters struggle when you come when you've uh, knitted the heel and turned the heel and now you come to picking up stitches 
down the side of the heel flap. You, a lot of knitters have complained that they struggle. There is a, a you know, there is a, th a thought that once you wash it, the hole goes away, um, which is true. <laughs> but that still doesn't distract from the fact that when you're knitting it and, and you keep looking at that hole, it's... <laughs> so, I want to give you a tip, which is a, um, a combination of my mum's tip and my tip. So, just to help you with that little hole. First of all, when you start your heel flap, if you're doing a heel stitch, which is what this one is, where the first row is um, slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, and then your, uh, your pull row is just slip one, pull to the end. Now, the first row of this heel flap, don't slip the first stitch, right? What you do is you knit two stitches. And then you go into slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one to the end of the row. And that's the only, just for that row. Your, your uh, purl row is the same, slip one, pull to the end of the row. When you come to your second row of your, of your um, heel, you are as normal. Slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one. So it's just for the first row. So that's the first tip. And then when you come to picking up the stitches down the heel flap here, as you come up, so say you've, you have um, knitted um, 32 rows of your heel flap. That means you, theoretically you're going to pick up 16 stitches um, up the side of your heel flap. But when you come to here just before you knit the instep stitches, pick up an extra stitch in that gap knit across and then when you pick when you want to come to pick up on this side pick up an extra stitch here it doesn't matter so because then it, that extra stitch pulls the whole thing together and you won't have a hole there and then all you need to do is when you when you decreasing for your gusset you just do one extra uh, decrease here and then your stitches go back to 64 same as up here, whether you had 64 or 72 here, you'll be back to 64 or 72 on this side. So that's a tip that I use all the time and I've never had a problem with that. Uh, the other thing that I do as well is up at the top here, when I cast on, I cast on with two needles. I generally knit my socks with 2.25 a millimeter double point and I will do a continental cast on over two over two needles and it's quite stretchy enough and comes over the foot quite easily. Now, so I'm nearly finished with the other one. I'll just put this one down and I'll show you. This is my sock bag. I like this one. My last one I gave away to, to Robin, the friend who gave me this yarn. Um, and she uses it all the time. So basically, it's just, I like Ed Hardy stuff. And I have my pattern printed on fabric. Um, so just so I can check occasionally, sometimes with the length of the foot, I have to, I have to double check back to see um, how long for how many stitches. And inside the, the bag, I have a little cheat sheet for Kitchener Stitch. Um, and it's just big enough and it's always in my bag. I do also use a DPN, DPN Cozy. Um, now, why am I showing you this? Oh, right. Uh, but all the socks that I did before, my little signature was, I was going to make it just a, like one red, just one red row like this. But with these, it's not going to show up. So I'm going to do green, like the green that is from those socks there you see so you'll definitely be able to see that one row anyway and they're nearly finished and then they can wing their way to england and go and keep somebody's feet warm and he's got big feet the whole thing is that i think the foot is 28 centimeters it goes on a bit anyhow so that those are all my socks and i wanted to share with you the book 
that really got me started on socks. Um, Folk Socks by Nancy Bush. Apart from the fact that in the front of the book is a lot of history of socks and um, there's in the introduction it says no article of human apparel has been more taken for granted than the sock. That normally has me. But there's there's a lot of historic information in the book. So I would I would recommend that. But it also has further on in the book, it has let me find it, let me find it, let me find it. How to knit a sock, right? Um so it has a classic sock pattern. In there and that's that's when I started to kind of study it and see what makes a sock a sock but what I do like is that she gives you heel variations um, so as you know you know socks are just completely mathematical so you could pretty much do any of those heels on whatever amount of you know, stitches you have on the heel um, little interesting Things there and the other thing that she does as well is that she gives you a few variations on how to end off your toe and I think is it this one I think it's on the next page I'm going to try that one next time the star toe I um, there's um a German uh, podcast that I listen to vidcast on YouTube um, by a lady called Kiko Strickschule from Wiesbaden and she always ends off her socks with um, ein Stern -Zee. and I've never done this before but she seems to have, I'm going to try it because she prefers it and often knits it so I'll see what what the difference is and then of course in the book there are there are actual patterns in the book and there is, which is super, super exciting, and I'm definitely going to do this because I have a friend who's going to be wearing a kilt soon, soon. And I'm going to knit those at some stage with those other two hands that I own. <laughs> so, highly recommend it if you're into socks. Folk Socks by Nancy Bush. It was, I think I did check before I looked, it was a tech, I don't know what this means, is it text copyright 1994, does that mean that's when it was published? Um, but yes, so I think it's still available, I think this I bought from Interweave Press. Um, if you're into socks and if you want to broaden your, your knowledge of socks and the importance of socks, etc, etc, then I would be, I would be recommending that. And then the other thing, also sock related, a lot of us have balls and balls and balls of leftover sock yarn from socks that we've knitted, sorry. Oh, it's baie warm, baie warm, which means very warm, very warm. So what, I've, what I do is... I, I have them here, just in a basket, and I do, I've been working on a cozy memories blanket for years, <laughs> and I'll just show you what it looks like, and it's not very far because I don't have so much time, as I said before, I have two other hands that I employ occasionally. But that's basically what it is. It's all over the internet. There, there are lots and lots and lots of patterns that you can follow. But I like this one. It's four ply. So it's not so incredibly heavy. And then when this is, and I still have some over, I put it in here. So these ones here are just small balls of yarn that are still left over um, that I may or may not incorporate into the blanket but I've been I've just uh, joined a group called Scrappy Sock Knitters and I was all ready to go 
think, oh, that's a really good thing to do with this. But this is a good time to segue into my new obsession. Which those of you who know me must be so sick and tired of listening to this. I have become a beginner weaver. This is so exciting. And I've done a course, I did a, an online course with a lady called Kelly Casanova, a beginner's course. I'm using a rigid heddle loom. I started off just borrowing one from the shop where I work, basically because I needed to know how to sell it. You know, I, I, I would have people phone in and go, I'm looking for a 10 DPI um, read. And I think, oh my, what on earth is that? That's what sparked my interest because now it's something that I've, I haven't done before. So in order for me to convincingly sort of sell it, I started to read up about weaving a little bit and I thought, oh, I think I'll, I'll give it a go. Well, hello. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. I just borrowed a little 30 centimeter um, knitter's loom and rigid head loom on the same thing. Knitter's loom is just the one that you can fold up and take along with you, whereas a rigid one is what it says it is. It's rigid. So I did my first weaving. I had... I've got so much yarn, I could start my own shop, and I, I had this yarn, it was a 10-ply cotton that I bought. I think I bought it because I was just high on yarn fumes, <laughs> and I bought it, and I had it. I had absolutely no idea what to do with it, but what I have done is I have woven some placemats, and I'm going to give them to Nicholas tonight. So I did two, there are lots of mistakes in it, lots. Um, for example, I forgot to measure when I started that line there, um, oh, all kinds of things. But I learned a lot. I m apparently have done quite a good job of um, keeping the edges straighter. And when you weave... You, what can happen is you can get what's called draw in and it seems like I've, I've managed to, to not <laughs> draw in. So I've got four of those. I did the course twice because it's an online course so you've got it forever and I thought okay I'm going to do it again. So I did it again. So I managed to do four, four table, um, table mats and then I started to play around a little bit uh, when you weave, you have um, this heddle and you beat down the weft up against each other and they say, you know, you shouldn't beat it too hard, blah, blah, blah. So I had started to play around and I beat the weft down and I had, because I still had some warp left and I wasn't going to uh, to waste it. So I, I carried on weaving and I managed to weave a piece and I've actually made something. I'm so happy, really. I, I can't tell you how much this has meant to me to actually learn a new skill here in the autumn years of my life. <laughs> but it's interesting um, because, and I am so like knitting and sewing and crocheting and everything. It's like it's a second nature to me. I don't have to think about what I'm doing with the needles or the yarn or anything. But weaving. <laughs> Are there five things I have to think of at the same time? And when I did the narrower pieces, I just had short little shuttles that I could that I wound the yarn around and used. But I'll show you something else I wove, which was on a 70 centimeter loom, and I had these long shuttles. I tell you something, it was like a war zone. <laughs> Anybody close to me would have been in the firing line. Just to get a handle on how to deal with these with these shuttles was was interesting and and marvelous so so I made these for my son I made this little pouch for myself which I'm which I love and um, but then there was still yarn over and I thought oh I've got to get rid of this yarn I can't um, it's just you know so then I made to go with the table mats I crocheted a little trivet with the rest of the yarn but anyway that's just typical if you're going 
going around and around and around. So I made the trivet, which is nice and thick, and I still had yarn left over. So then I also made two dishcloths with the leftover 10 ply yarn. And that's it. I've actually busted that stash. I'm so happy about that. I can't even tell you um, because I just, I've just got so much yarn. I really, really need to start using it up. So there it is. All of these things I made on the loom and with my crochet hook and with my sewing machine. And I'm super proud of that achievement. I really had a lot of fun doing it. And while I, I, I was working on this, I... Oh, should I do books first? I'll do books first. I started to... When I was studying um, some fashion and textiles, we, we did a little bit of research on this book, but not enough. And I bought this book, Woman's Work, The First 20,000 Years. And it's if you are a textile geek like I am, Go and get this book. It's it's so well written and so informative and it's written in layman's terms. So you're not wading through academic writings and findings and things. It's just readable and well written. And it's by Elizabeth Wayland Barber. 20,000 years ago, women were making and wearing the first clothing created from spun fibers. In fact, right up to the Industrial Revolution, the fiber arts were an enormous economic force belonging primarily to women. Despite the great toil required in making cloth and clothing, most books on ancient history and economics have no information on them. The extreme perishability of what women produced is largely responsible for this omission. A gap that leaves out virtually half the picture of prehistoric prehistoric and early historic cultures. But today, new discoveries about the textile arts are revealing women's vital role in pre-industrial societies. Elizabeth Whalen Barber has drawn from data gathered by the most sophisticated new archaeological methods, methods she herself helped to fashion, to show that women were a powerful economic force in the ancient and early modern worlds with their own industry fabric loving it. So what I'm doing is I'm vacillating between these two books. This one is The Golden Thread, How Fabric Changed History by Cassia Sinclair. I think I also told you about the book that she uh, she wrote about colour. Um, I'm, I'm reading it, but, but I'm enjoying this one more at the moment. And I think it's because I've started to weave. So I, I, I kind of, I feel like I, there's a connection. I feel so connected to my ancestors. In, in a, I feel in a very sort of, this is not hippy dippy stuff. It's just reading the book and learning to weave. It's, it's giving me a connection to what they were doing and how they were doing it and who came up with methods of weaving and why did it happen and how did it happen and that's what this book is is telling me a lot so i feel like with no other um, needlework that i do or crafts that i do do i feel as much of an a connection to my ancestors since i've started weaving i hope that's not too out there i also had an incredible feeling of um and it's probably part of just being very involved in the weaving process. I had this little flash run through my head. I just had this this image of, of a young girl of about 10 sort of setting up a loom around a tree. It was a backstrap loom around a tree. It was so momentary and quick and it kind of felt like it came from somewhere else other than just what I'm doing every day. So if you're a believer in reincarnation, well, you can extrapolate on that little story if you like. But for Christmas, let's go to Christmas. I was given a loom, a 70 centimeter loom with all the different heddles. And I thought to myself, you know what? 
go big or go home. I had, again, once again, stash busting. I had a lot of four-ply cotton um, that I was not enough of anything to really do something with. And I have a young friend who's having a baby. And she's an incredibly good knitter. And I thought, mm, I, she's probably going to have so much knitted stuff. And this is Australia. And it's summer. And it's really, really hot. Sorry, I'm just going to have another sip. Mm. <laughs> it's very very hot and I think the baby is coming sort of in March I think March which is super hot so I just warped up my loom all 140 slots and I, I used and I thought I'm going to use up all my cotton and I'm going to make a little baby shrug um, that she can use for her baby now in in summertime and this is what happened I it was so much fun so those are those are the warp threads and then I just used up the weft I used up all the cotton to make the the weft uh, uh, yes to make the weft and then I bought myself a nifty little machine called a Fringe Twister. That's such a naughty name, don't you think? But anyway, so the Fringe Twister, and I twisted up all that fringe. And yes, I'm actually, I think I've done a good enough job to, to give it to her for a gift. I managed to keep the edges relatively straight. And my draw-in, which is normally what happens when you, when you weave, you have a draw-in. So you lose about 10% on the beginning warp. My draw-in, if nothing else, was consistent throughout. So that's going to go to her, and I'm very proud of it, and I really hope she's going to love it. Um, just a little baby shawl for summer evenings. And so that's going to wing its way um, into Vic uh, country Victoria. And then, of course, now I've got nothing on my warp. And I've still got all this four ply cotton left. And they're really, really strong colours, which are which are my favourite. I like strong colours. And I've been watching on YouTube some Guatemalan weaving, backstrap loom weaving, and the colours are all very bright. And I thought that's it. I'm actually going to weave, I'm gonna use a thinner dent. So with that. With that one, I used a 10 dent reed. With this one, I'm going to use a 12.5 dent reed. I'm just going by my gut instinct. I'm assuming that if I use a 12.5 dent reed, my, fi my fabric is going to be a denser, more closely woven fabric. If there's a weaver listening, <laughs> you can maybe tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. And that I'm going to make bags. So I'll just warp up a few meters, maybe three. I think I've got enough yarn there to warp up at least three meters. And then I'm just going to sit here and I might try a new, some new techniques and just have a little bit of fun with, the, um, with weaving the rest of this yarn. And then on the 6th of February, I've signed up for a four shaft loom weaving course, which I don't even know what it is but nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I will have something to tell you about that in episode four, whenever that might be. I think I've managed to get through everything. It doesn't feel like very long, but I have been chatting for a long time. Um, goodbye from a very hot Melbourne and looking forward to seeing and chatting with you in episode four um, I will put links to the yarn and the courses that I'm doing down at the bottom I do post most of my work on Instagram where I'm Judith Mitchell or me under the tree too and you can go and have a look at my work there and if you have anything to say about um, what I'm doing or what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing right <laughs> 
or if you have any questions about uh, if you would like me to do a tutorial on any particular craft I can do most knitting and crochet and sewing I would like to start showing a bit of sewing in the near future as I am teaching um, one or two people to sew so it would be nice if, if you would like to learn about sewing or know about sewing or see what I make I would that would be lovely as well if you have any questions on sock making or sock knitting please don't hesitate to ask me I'll try and answer all the questions uh, that that I'm asked and thank you very much for watching have a lovely 2021 until the next time we see you Bye.